Hi, everyone. Welcome to our public event today, In Praise of Stuff, the Tenement Museum Collection. I'm Lana Dubin. I'm the Tenement Museum's Collections Manager, and I'm very excited to be sharing um, the program with you today. Before we start, I wanted to address um, the weather conditions last night. Since we are discussing the Tenement Museum collection, I'm happy to report that we had a very small amount of water in our cellar, but that all of the objects are okay. Um, the museum is in a, uh, has a relatively good drainage and sewer system, um, which relates back to the history of the city. So for everyone who was concerned, um, the museum is relatively dry and doing well. And I hope the same for everyone else's, um, everyone else who is tuning in right now. So without further ado, I'm going to start the program. Okay, so this is In Praise of Stuff, the Tenement Museum Collection. And while I'm presenting, please feel free to share in the chat any questions you have about the content, about the collection, or about the museum. Um, the program is being monitored and those questions will be shared with me. So we're gonna look at four categories of stuff that make up the Tenement Museum collection. The Tenement Museum is unlike many other museums. Other museums, a wealthy benefactor will have a large amount of items, will donate them or will um, have them preserved in perpetuity in a museum. Um, sometimes a entire historic home will be preserved, but the Tenement Museum is completely unique in that it was discovered in 1988 by Ruth Abrams and Anita Jacobson and they found essentially a time capsule of a building. Um, there was, it is a five floor uh, old style tenement building and everything, all of the occupied apartments had been abandoned uh, circa 1935. So for around 50 years, everything in that building had just been left behind. So the first category of items that we're gonna discuss is what is left behind. And to tell the story, I'm going to look at one family, the Baldizi family and the Baldizi exhibit to look at the four categories that we have in our collection. So the collection, the collection is made up of what is left behind, archeology, span what is passed down, so family heirlooms of the descendants, what is remembered um, or oral histories, and then what is let go. And that's period pieces that people don't passed down in their families and the museum has had to acquire on our own. So what we're looking at right now is the third floor of 97 Orchard Street. And this is what it looked like in 1988 when it was discovered in its state of disrepair. And so these both of these photographs show a large built-in cabinet in a kitchen space. And um, this really shows the condition of the building when um, it was discovered. There were items that we call ghost chairs. Um, so things that people had left behind. There, you can see over here, there was a baby doll head um, and just remnants. There's linoleum, um, architectural fragments, lighting fragments, et cetera. And Here's another angle. You could see there's even an alcohol bottle, um, but this really shows the conditions that were in the building when it was discovered. And so the building, as you can see, is not in great condition. Um, and in order for the museum to uh, structurally stabilize the building, they needed to go floor by floor. So this apartment that we're looking at is on the third floor of the building. Well, the museum starting out needed to work up from the ground. So this, um, what we're looking at right now is the actual Baldizi apartment. Um, so in the early days of the museum, uh, the founders had sent out um, advertisements, classifieds, letters to people who um, had been residents of the building, uh, seen on census records and um, directories, and to try to find more information about the real people who had lived in 97 Orchard. And 
this is a little bit of tour lore, um, but there's two ways the story is told. Either Josephine Baldizi saw one of these classified ads and came by the museum, or she just happened to be walking down the street and saw um, a lot of commotion and activity in 97 Orchard. But either way, she connected with uh, the museum's founders and was able to tell the museum an immense amount of information about her childhood living in 97 Orchard. Um, so one of the things she mentioned, and also I should mention too, the Baldizi family does not show up on any of the census records, any of the directories, or any of the documentation that the museum was looking at. So this is a real um, happenstance to have uh, wonderful information coming from a descendant who we really had no idea was in the building. So um, Josephine gave the museum such a wealth of information that hers was one, the Baldizi apartment was one of the very first apartments to be recreated. Um, because like I said before, it was not structurally sound to recreate her apartment in its exact location on the third floor, the museum decided to make the apartment on the second floor. So in the process of making that apartment, Josephine came into the building and said, you know, my father was a master carpenter and here's her father Adolfo right here with one of his beautiful creations. This was later on in his life. Uh, my father was a master carpenter and he made this beautiful built-in cabinet for our family's apartment. And the museum had no idea who had made these built-ins. Um, a lot of them were, uh, you know, this was the only apartment that had a built-in cabinet of this nature. The other ones had ones that the landlords had put in or ones that were purchased. Um, but such an intricate cabinet, uh, the museum had no idea where it had come from and how to interpret it. So. Um, Josephine telling us about the cabinet when the museum was interpreting and um, creating her second floor apartment, they pulled the cabinet away from the wall. And you can see here the pencil markings that show where Adolfo marked on the wall exactly where the measurements needed to be. It also shows us a lot about the different paint layers and helped us uh, form our vision for what the apartment would look like with the specific color of paint. So here's the apartment as it is today, recreated. This is on the second floor. You could see Adolfo's cabinet right here, placed into the location. Um, and it's wonderful to be able to have this direct, what we call archeology span to reference and have an authentic piece that the Baldizi family created and used in their apartment. Um, the museum has quite a lot of what we call archaeology um, during this initial renovation process. Anytime the floorboards were opened up or the walls were opened up for structural stabilization, all of the contents were removed and sifted through a large screen to reveal what people ate, what their occupations were. Um, there are things like buttons and um, advertisements and paper dolls and mouse skeletons and all sorts of interesting things that we find in the building. So our first category of collections that the museum draws from is this archeology. span What is left behind? What did we have initially to work with that was in the building? And what stories can we find by connecting the other categories to this initial category? So this brings me down to what is passed down. So like I was saying, all of these categories form one unified collection, although there are very different types of objects. So we're gonna be talking about heirlooms that were passed down within the Baldizi family specifically. So what you're looking at right here is from the archives. Um, and this is Josephine Baldizi's handwritten recollections of different recipes. And I will read this um, because I know that not everyone in the audience can read her beautiful cursive writing. Um, in 1993, the founders of the museum decided that they wanted to make a tenement cookbook and they reached out to um, alumni and descendant families to try to get recipes that have been cooked in 97 Orchard. 
And this is the recipe, three recipes that Josephine Baldizzi submitted in 1993 that are in our archives. So it starts off a morning recipe when you had very little on hand, hot milk with butter and sugar and stale bread soaked in the milk. It was delicious, almost like a pudding. Lunch, large loaf of round Italian bread, slice in half right through the middle, pour olive oil over both halves, sprinkle salt, pepper, cheese, and oregano over the bread. Bake in oven until slightly brown. You can also add leftover tomato sauce or even fresh tomatoes. You will have a delicious pizza. This can also be tried with any type of bread and toppings to your taste. So that's her lunch recipe, which is making me like very hungry right now. I love a good, uh, you know, Italian bread pizza. Um, but one of the beautiful things about her recipes is that she also includes these memories and recollections of her family. So you can see over here, um, it says, I can still see my mother in front of this big black stove, putting the bread in the oven, and my father would peel an orange and put the skins on the stove. This sent out a nice aroma. And finally, we're going to go to the dinner recipe. Uh, my favorite is stew, which can be made with any kind of meat, veal, beef, or chicken. Saute onions and garlic, add meat, cook until golden brown, add veggies, carrots, potatoes, which have been cut up, add peas or any other vegetables you have in the fridge, stir all together, mixing well, then add water to cover, season salt and pepper to your taste. You can also add tomatoes if you, if you prefer a pink looking stew, which I do. Cover, bring to a boil, lower flame to medium heat and cook for 10, 20 to 25 minutes. Stirring every so often. Test potatoes and veggies. When they are cooked to your texture, it's done. With a loaf of Italian bread and a delicious dish of our stew, you could face the day with a smile. Stews and pasta with sauce, a vegetable or beans was mostly what we had to eat because you can stretch the plates. You could feed a lot of people with just a few things and it was healthy and delicious. So these recipes, there is so much in this beyond just the food. It speaks about Josephine Baldizzi growing up in the depression and the need for her family to stretch food. Um, it also talks about uh, what her family did to carry on food traditions from Italy. It also talks about her father being home a lot. Um, he was out of work a lot during the depression. And so her memories of her father cutting up the orange and peeling it um, all of these things really help form our vision of what the Baldizzi apartment looked like. And I see that there's a couple of questions from the audience. So Madeline asked, how was Adolfo able to build a cabinet into the wall? Was it a thick wall or was there a closet? And this is a wonderful question. It kind of speaks to the history of the building. So 97 Orchard was constructed in 1863 and did not have any indoor plumbing or toilets. Um, it should also not have an air shaft. So in 1901, there was a new tenement law that was passed that required interior lighting, interior ventilation, um, as well as some other uh, upgrades to the building. So the building, they installed two hallway toilets on each floor, as well as an air shaft. And installing this, they actually pulled the walls out. So in a lot of the other apartments, you will see a little crevice in the kitchen um, or where there was cabinets and shelvings put. Um, so what he did was there was essentially like a recessed area in the wall and Adolfo just built a cabinet right into that recessed area. Um, there also was a question about what type of, type of items were found in the hallway toilets. Um, that is a wonderful question. And uh, the toilets themselves have not had as much archaeology um, done on them. However, we are going to be undergoing a large um, structural stabilization and renovation, hopefully in the oncoming year. And the toilets are slated to have some projects. So stay tuned. We will see what we pull out of the toilets. Um, we have had archaeology done in the privy yard, in the rear backyard, and it is fascinating to see the shards of chamber pots and a beer stein and a lot of the ceramics that were pulled out of um, the privy, which seems to also have served as a uh, rubbish bin. All right, and then the final question, 
um, is how many people were in the Baldizi family. So I'll go back to this apartment just so we could briefly see. Oh, um, so the Baldizi family was a relatively smaller family for 97 Orchard. Um, we tell the stories of families from 1863 all the way up until 1935 in this building and then continue on in our other building, 103 Orchard Street. Um, the families that lived earlier on in the building tended to have very large numbers of families and even borders that added to um, the space. The Baldizis, however, were just Adolfo and Rosaria, the parents, and Johnny and Josephine, um, the daughter and son. Um, so what I will do is I am going to, um, briefly give a tour of the apartment just so that we could see what it looks like fully. Um, cause that's a good question. Okay. So we're in the parlor of the Baldizi apartment right now. And what you're looking at is the bed frame that um, Rosaria and Adolfo would sleep on. So they slept in this parlor um, and then during the day would put their bed away so that they had room. So I'm just gonna very slowly go around so you can see the parlor. And you'll see tier two, Adolfo's toolbox is on the floor. And then Johnny and Josephine slept in the bedroom, which is the smallest room in the um, apartment. And they slept on a fold up cot, which they had to cover and make look nice and neat every day. Um, so that's where the family slept. Um, it's a 325 square foot apartment. Um, all of our apartments are around the same size. And here as well is the air shaft I was talking about that allowed the room um, for Adolfo's cabinet to be built. So I'm going to go back to the program. Okay. So in addition to these um, written memories, these written recipes that have been passed down through a family that we consider heirlooms, we also have objects. So all of these objects were owned by the Baldizi family during the depression and Josephine donated them to the museum. Um, the, uh, I'm also seeing Okay, so I'll get to some more of these questions later on. Um, so all of these um, were donated by the Baldizi family and they speak to the recipes that I described before. So you could see the ladle here and the bowl with which that they would have served some stew, a colander here for draining pasta or steamed vegetables. And what's fascinating is that um, they were of modest means. They lived during the depression. And so the fact that these were handed down and saved by Josephine and then donated to the museum really speaks to what the family valued and um, their lives uh, as new immigrants in the United States. So here too, um, you can see the stove as well. Um, and the uh, cabinet where they would have cooked. Um, so I'm going to go, this is the stove that it's a coal stove with an electric or with a um, gas topper on it. And this is the stove that, uh, you know, Josephine is describing still seeing her mother in front of the big black stove, putting the bread in the oven and her father peeling an orange and putting the skins on the stove. And this is that stove. Um, so it's wonderful to be able to connect these memories and the heirlooms of what is passed down with these stories. Okay, so our third category is what is remembered. And um, Josephine was obviously so happy to share her memories with the museum. Um, we have hours of recording. She sat with the museum multiple time periods to really tell us um, what her life was like um, during the time period. 
the Baldizis, I saw a question um, about what time period the Baldizis lived in the building. They, so this is where it gets a little iffy with Josephine's memory. She remembers moving in at around first grade. However, that would have been, um, and, but she also remembers being in around the depression. So we think that she moved in around 1928, probably maybe a little, little earlier. Um, and they lived there um, until the building closed in the 1930s. So they lived for a brief period of time, but it was a significant, significant period of time. Um, when we get further, we'll also talk about other people that lived in the building that were on census records and that we have other records of. And it's really wonderful to be able to correlate Josephine's memories um, with the, the primary documentation. Okay, so we're back in the kitchen and I'm going to stop talking so that I can let Josephine share her story. I remember sitting around the table in the kitchen under the window and we would be, my mother would have made us a fried egg or something on a roll with butter and my father would put the ketchup on it and uh, that was a treat every Saturday, uh, had to be Saturday or Sunday, we would sit around and enjoy that roll with the butter. My mother would be moving around, always cooking, serving, doing things. Busy as a bee, never sitting down. The sink is where we wash dishes, where we washed our bodies. <laughs> and there was a little tub uh, next to it. And uh, maybe once a week, my mother would heat up the water and give us a bath, both of us, in one tub. Every morning, she would stand in front of the sink and strip to the waist and go like this, you know, wash her, scrub herself. And... You know, she was extra clean, my mother. So that was very important to her, that we would be just as clean as she was. And in the kitchen, over the sink, is a shelf that has linen starch, banami, and she used to have this pink soap and steel wool, I guess, to polish her pots, because they called my mother shine them up Sadie. She loved to shine her pots. And uh, the banami used to go on the windows, it became so dusty all over. You got double work. And uh, the linen starch, do I remember linen starch? Because it cut my neck and my brother's neck the way my mother used to starch our clothes, the shirts and the uh, dresses and her house dresses, everything. Linens were starch, stiff. They stood up by themselves. So... That beautiful memory that Josephine just shared um, is largely of her mother keeping the house clean, but she's describing all of these items that we're seeing. So this, which is an original um, basin, is the original basin that she and Johnny were bathed in. And this is the sink that she's describing her mother stripping to the waist and scrubbing herself in. Um, there were no showers in the building, so they would have had to go to a bathhouse in order to shower. So that really speaks to her um, keeping clean in the building. So then we also have some specific products that Josephine remembers. So we have this linen starch, the pink soap and steel wool, and the bonami. I remember. So here's a close up. You could see the linen starch, the bona, uh, and the pink wool. Uh, the pink soap and the steel wool. And this linen starch was actually donated by Josephine Baldizi. So again, this idea of an heirloom, like, you know, I doubt that this was her mother's linen starch that was passed down through the family, but it's something that Josephine remembers that she continued to use, that she saved on for nostalgia purposes, that she references in her oral history that we then put into the collection. Um, so it's wonderful to be able to have kind of these combination objects where it's not an heirloom, it's referenced in an oral history. We know that they used it. We have Josephine's original linen starch. Um, and personally, it's rare to be in a museum where you have descendant families donating cleaning products because of how much meaning they had to the family. Um, 
So this is a close up and I'm going to play this video of the linnet starch, but you can see here what's called an accession number. Um, so this is how we keep track of the objects. So the accession number for this is 940214. And that tells me this box was donated in 1994. It was the second group of donations of that year, and it's the 14th object within that donation. Um, so that's how we manage the collections. But you could see here, Josephine used it. Uh, it was 15 cents at the time. Um, there still is the starch in it that when we store to preserve it, we have to keep it separate. Um, there's recipes for how to use the linen starch. And it even says, try it in the baby's bath to perfect his skin. Um, so I have never heard of people starching their baby's bath. Um, and Josephine herself talks about how much it cut her neck and she didn't like it. But it's really interesting, this like memory of her having these semi-negative associations with linen starch and it being uncomfortable, but then her holding on to a box and then donating it to the museum as an emblem of her life growing up there. Okay, so I'm going to answer a couple other questions. Um, there was a question about uh, wondering if there was no record whether the Baldizis were potentially legal subletters. And um, there, we do not have like records of the building um, with leases and that sort of thing with landlords. So um, all of the rent tenants that we know of would have rented directly from the landlord and would have paid the landlord directly for their rent. Um, there was no credit checks. There was no any of the um, requirements that you have today to rent an apartment. Um, and so likely they saw an ad for the apartment or heard from uh, friends or community member that there was an apartment open and um, went to rent the apartment, negotiated the fee with the landlord directly and then paid. We have um, records of how much each person paid. And it's quite interesting to see that there was no rhyme or reason towards the rent. It seems like it was slightly cheaper the higher floor you went, but it's very unclear what the standard rent was for the building, especially throughout different periods of time. Um, it's likely that the Baldizis, when a census taker came around, were either not home or didn't answer the door. Um, so then another question was about the original floors. Um, and so that is another thing that is archeology span is our beautiful linoleum floors. Um, so let me head back so you can see those floors. So those are the original floors and they are all over the building. Um, some apartments had six layers of linoleum. Um, at the time, it was marketed as the rug you can mop. Um, and this shows a very typical period uh, linoleum from the time, which is a rug type pattern. Um, so all of the linoleum is original. All of the plaster is original. This built-in is original. Um, all the fixtures are original. Um, so it's really wonderful to be able to have this immense amount of archaeology that we're able to use in the apartments. Um, and then, oh, wonderful. And then we have another family, uh, family connection who also recalls linen starch being used, um, but it being used on their uniform glasses. So I love that people are making connections to Josephine and Josephine's story. All right, so let's go through and we're going to get to the final category. So this is what is let go and what is not remembered. So Josephine, like I mentioned, grew up in 97 Orchard during the Great Depression. And because Adolfo was often out of work and their family did not have a lot of means, they were recipients of FDR's home relief program which was um, a early social welfare type program that provided um, things like uh, shoes and food and um, rent relief occasionally um, to people who were suffering economic, uh, suffering from poverty during the Great Depression. And so Josephine does not, her fond memories are all of her father of being in the home. But when she thinks about what has, she didn't remember and like what, what she didn't save, home relief is one of those topics. So I'm gonna play um, her speaking with Rita Bonifiglio. So here actually is a great photo. Here's uh, 
Josephine Baldizi, her brother Johnny, and Rita Bonifiglio, who was a um, girl who lived in the building. Uh, their families were so close that Rita's mother was Josephine's godmother during her Holy Communion. Um, Rita, the families, after they moved out of 97 Orchard, they actually moved near each other in Brooklyn. Um, and Rita, um, Josephine connected the museum with Rita. And so Rita also gave quite a lot of oral history. So I'm going to play this clip, which is her um, not so positive memories of receiving um, items under home relief. Yeah, and they huge. came and investigated every once in a while to make sure that you were deserving of this home relief. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like today. Today, I don't think anybody investigates. I mean, they gave him like ugly shoes, like boy shoes. They gave us stamps. Remember those? And then dresses? how many pairs of shoes? My goodness. One for the year or two. One out of the, the year. When, the, when your They're Sunday ugly. shoes got old, you wore them every day. And, they were ugly. and then you got. Yeah, so you hear Rita say, and they were ugly. So they, they did not have fond memories of receiving shoes um, in, in home relief. Um, however, this was the only way that Josephine would receive shoes. So she even has a memory of receiving men's shoes that were completely of the wrong size, but she needed to wear them. Um, so one of the other things that they received in home relief was um, government cheese. And so this was boxes of cream cheese and other cheeses. And so um, I'm gonna briefly go into <laughs> the reason why cheese was shared. Um, but essentially dairy farmers were also suffering heavily during the, um, depression and they had excess dairy that could not be purchased. And so the government subsidized dairy farmers, paid them for their milk. Then that milk went to cheese factories, which were also subsidized by the government to make cheese. And then this government cheese was sent out to home relief recipients in boxes like this. Um, so I'm going to play this video so you can see the whole object of that good Sante cream cheese. Um, and it's pasteurized. Um, it's the beginning of processed food. So you can kind of think about uh, the memories that Josephine would have had with these like meals that her mother's making, but then also the processed food. Um, and this is something that Josephine did not give the museum these really don't show up in her oral histories. Um, we know that she has memories of what food she ate and what food she ate. Um, and I, you know, memories of boxes being around the apartment, but specifically the idea that she would save a government cheese box and donate that to the museum as an emblem of her family's legacy was not something that Josephine was interested in. Um, However, these government cheese boxes really speak to, um, again, the family's resiliency and Adolfo's creativity in making his family's home as beautiful as possible. So what you're looking at over here are morning glories that are planted in these cheese boxes in the windows. And so that was Josephine's memory. And um, her mother, Rosaria, immigrated, they all, the whole family immigrated from Palermo, uh, Sicily, Rosaria and Adolfo, and then Josephine and Johnny were born in the United States. Um, but uh, Rosaria never went back to Sicily and she really missed her homeland. And one of her favorite flowers were these morning glories. And so we know that Adolfo planted and used the cheese boxes as planters and planted morning, morning glories in them to um, make his wife feel more at home. So there's just these beautiful stories. Like these are period pieces. Um, they were either purchased by the museum or in many instances, um, literally dumpster dived. Um, the museum, when it was being founded in the late 1980s, early 1990s, this was a time period of great change on the Lower East Side. Many of the old tenants um, were passing away and their apartments were being cleaned out and lots of items were being put into dumpsters and on the street. And um, we had uh, a wonderful facilities director who liked to obtain objects for the collection by going through these dumpsters. Um, so in my collections database, the, the provenance, which is just a fancy word to say, where did these come from, of these objects is dumpster between uh, the corner of Hester and Orchard. Um, 
So again, the museum's objects come from a wide variety of sources. We have the archaeology, whatever was left behind in the building. So the built-in cabinet, um, these beautiful linoleum rugs, the historic um, architecture, historic fabric. Um, we also have what's passed down. So things that the families cherish, um, like the recipes that um, Josephine passed down and the cooking implements. And then we have what's remembered. Um, so what they talk about in their oral histories, like the linnet starch and how that helps us form um, our ideas of what the apartment would look, back, look like. And then what is let go? These period pieces that families do not hold on to, um, but they think about and they reference and they are important um, to tell the family story. Um, so I'm going to ask, um, <laughs> We're going to switch over and we could do some more question and answer. Um, but I also wanted to make sure that everyone, um, if you're interested in the program, that you like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, so I'm going to go stop sharing and I'm going to switch over to the 360 tour while we answer some questions. Okay. So right now we're in the 360 tour. We were in the 360 tour. Okay. So what I wanted to point out were um, some of the things that Josephine mentioned in her oral history um, that we have featured in the apartment. So she mentioned her mother always listening to Sicilian music, Italian music on the radio. So here we have a piece that we purchased from the museum um, that's a period appropriate radio that's actually the cheapest model of the radio that they, they made. Um, oh, okay, let's see. So we have, we have a question about the placement of the cabinet and I'm not quite sure what that means. Um, so hopefully my lovely production assistant, Danielle, um, can clarify a little bit. Um, but the cabinet, I'm going to clarify a little bit more. So in this hallway, you can see on the other side right here, there are two uh, toilets, two water closets that are in the hallway. Um, in order to make room for these two water closets, they shaved off a little bit of the bedrooms and pulled it out. They also expanded this wall outwards. So there's an air shaft behind the um, bathrooms that provide ventilation, um, which you kind of think like is a gross location behind the bathrooms. I can only imagine how it would smell. Um, but this also provided, you could see a little bump out here. It created these um, recesses in the wall when they moved it. So we're not sure at what point Adolfo moved in, whether there was already an existing cabinet there um, or an existing like shelves. Many of the other apartments just have shelves in this little recessed area, but we know that Adolfo built um, this cabinet uh, by hand. Okay. So hopefully that explains where that hole came from. Um, if you could see it here as well. All right. Uh, All right, I'm looking at seeing. Okay, so we have a question about the textiles. Are any of them original? Or are they mostly source period pieces? So this is really an interesting question. It very much depends on what the family valued. Um, so we have a family called the Confino family, and they were a Sephardic family from Castoria, Greece. And one of the things that's very important to them are these mantas, um, which are woolen shaggy like floor mattresses. So the Confinos have donated many of their mantas to the museum. Those are original textiles that we have. The Baldizis did not donate any mantas so, or any um, fabrics or textiles. So what you're looking at are all period pieces, the tablecloth, the um, uh, curtain, the clothing that's on the um, washer dryer. And I'm actually gonna correct myself. 
there is a few textile pieces that are original to the family. So this right here was from um, Rosario, Rosario Mutolo Baldizzi's trousseau. So when Rosario was married, this came, this was her box of like her wedding dowry that came with her um, for her wedding. So um, we have two of these embroidered kitchen towels that have Rosaria's name embroidered in them. We also have a bedspread. Um, so the, I, I correct myself, none of the clothing or the textiles in the home um, that's like on, on um, like pinned up are original to the Baldizis, but the, uh, there are some very fine detailed period pieces that are original to the uh, Baldizis. Um, so the water closets are, one of the questions is how big was the water closet and did it contain a toilet or a full bath? Um, the water closet is literally just a toilet. Um, I, I wish I could have a photo to pull up um, right now for you so you could see, but it is just two toilets right next to each other. So each apartment, each floor has four apartments per floor. So there's the central staircase and then there's four apartments. And then in between the two apartments are the two water closets. So when thinking about the size of a family, you can imagine how crowded those toilets would be. So many families had, um, I'll go over here to show, nearly all the families also had, where are you? Where are you? I think everyone knows what I'm looking for, which is a chamber pot. Oh, well. We'll find the chamber pot, but most families also had a chamber pot um, up until the 1930s um, because the bathrooms were always crowded um, and it was just a lot easier rather than waiting to go to uh, the bathroom at night. Um, there's also a question from Della if kosher food was available from Home Relief. And that's a really wonderful question that I don't know the answer to. Um, but I will look into that. And if you want to email me, that is a wonderful question. We are currently um, launched a new exhibit called Tenement Women that tells the story of um, the kosher meat riot in 1902. And, um, you know, women um, being both political activists outside of the home, but also managing um, the duties of inside of their home. And I'm going to look into home relief and whether it provided kosher food, because that is just a fascinating question. Um, and so another question is, what is my favorite part of the job? And do I specialize in a specific area? So one of the, my favorite part of the job is, um, I do something different every day. So certain days I might be doing pest management. Um, there could be, um, I could be sourcing historic light bulbs. I could be repairing a table. And then I could work with a researcher who's researching um, street vending at the turn of the century. Um, so every single day is different. And one of the beautiful things about working at the Tenement Museum is that it is such a small museum that um, my position is, even though it's in the curatorial department, I work with every single person in all the departments. So I work with education um, to talk about objects that they could potentially, um, we could introduce to tell new stories or objects that they want to highlight um, or even um, placement of like, documents within the room. Um, we have, I'll go over here. We have on all of our tours, um, additional documents that we store in here. Um, so people can see photographs of the Baldizis and see what home relief looked like. And you'll see a little FDR over here. Um, I also work with maintenance and facilities when things go wrong. Um, I work with development to try to find funding for these projects. Um, so it's a really wonderful job. Like I get to do a lot of little things um, all the time. And then um, I don't specialize in a particular area other than collections. Um, so I have worked for the National Park Service and other museums in managing collections. Um, most of them were historic objects. Um, so American objects uh, from 
1600s all the way up until the present. Um, I have worked with art collections, but you really need a diverse set of skills. So to be able to repair a historic chair, but then also um, darn a, uh, you know, a broken um, lace towel, or, you know, I need to be able to figure out um, the lighting fixture, we want to switch to LEDs. So I need to make sure that we have at a period appropriate uh, light for the fixture. So these are just like a lot of little things that I do, um, but I really enjoy my job. Um, I also have a background in anthropology, which definitely helps telling the stories of these families. Um, the Tenement Museum is a storytelling museum at its core, and anthropology um, is telling the stories of humans. Um, so it's wonderful to be able to connect the academic um, work with this position. Um, and then there's another question, and I saved this one for last, but it's about the structural work we'll be doing in the museum in the next year and what that will mean for the museum, which is a wonderful question. And we are figuring that out as we go. Um, but I'm going to go back over here. So COVID taught the museum that we need increased ventilation. Um, so the museum was obviously, uh, when it was a tenement building, a site of tuberculosis, a site of disease and poor ventilation. And um, the pandemic has really increased um, our need to increase the ventilation. So we are putting in a, um, a HVAC system um, to make things a little bit more comfortable. It is not going to be fully air conditioned. Um, people will still be hot in the summer and cold in the winter, but it's not going to be tw quite the same tenement conditions. Um, there's also going to be a fire suppression system that's going to be improved. Um, currently, we have sprinklers in the building, um, which are not period appropriate. You could see right there, there's a little sprinkler. Um, and we have fire guards and other fire um, suppression methods but they're going to be installing fire shutters all the way through this um, uh, air shaft as a vertical plenum. So that's the structural work, which is, um, you know, it's not, it's not small peanuts, but it's not anything major. And then the rest of the work is going to be doing things that are pretty much hidden to visitors. So you'll see up here that there's a crack. This means that the wall and the plaster has shifted. So we're going to be having conservators come in and do very detailed work, ensuring that this building looks the same. It's going to look like it was discovered in 1988. Um, we're still going to have the ruined apartments, but it's going to be structurally stable. And those um, things like the plaster will be preserved for years to come. Um, actually in this next building, I believe this was taken out, but you could see right here, there's currently a, a structural pole holding up the ceiling in this area, um, which you can't see in this, in this clip uh, because it's been removed. But all of these areas around the building where there are like structural damage that it doesn't make it unsafe for people to be in there, um, but we wanna make sure that the museum is around for another hundred years um, so that people can continue seeing the Baldizzi story. So those are some of the um, changes that are slated for the construction project. And there, oh, so I also have a question about what the pipes are. So this is an interesting um, question because we have quite a few pipes. So the first pipes that I'll show um, are these ones right here. And let's see if I can zoom in. So this is the gas meter. Um, so like I said, in 1901, a Tenement House Act law was passed that required increasing ventilation and increasing lighting. And one of the rules for the increased lighting was that there needed to be a light on at all times in the first floor interior stairwell of a building um, for safety purposes. And obviously landlords were not going to have people maintain kerosene lamps or maintain candles in the front hall of the building. So this was a big impetus for the landlord to install gas lighting into the building, as well as, um, yeah, just gas lighting. So here's the gas meter. Um, the Baldizis would have put a quarter in and the quarter would have lasted around a week of gas, depending how much they used it. 
Um, so some of these pipes are the gas piping. Um, you could see it also goes over here to the water tank. Um, so these are original water pipes as well. And the gas continues over here. And the Baldizis had um, what many of the families had at the time, which is this um, rain jet on the stove. It's a gas rain jet. So this, the stove is a coal burning stove. Um, it was the primary source of heat in the apartment. In the winters, it, the apartment would have been nice and cozy, but in the summers, it would have been unbearable. So the Baldizis would have used this gas stove to, to avoid having to turn on the coal stove um, in their apartment. Um, at the time, too, because of the depression, many families continued to use kerosene or candle lighting to avoid paying the gas for the lighting, um, but that's what some of the pipes are. Other pipes were installed um, in order for the museum to ob obtain a certificate of occupancy. So other pipes are the um, sprinkler pipes that allow the museum to conduct tours and um, maintain safety. And... So there is also some good questions um, about tours of the upgrades plant. So yes, we have a tour called Exploring 97 that is a specialty tour that goes into the history of the upgrades that the museum has done to the building. So kind of what I talked about, about how, um, you know, floor by floor, looking at the paint colors, looking at the structural history, um, but then we are also planning on while the museum is closed to do this renovation, which will not be long, it's only going to be around three or four months. Um, we are planning a variety of programmatic alternatives. So one of the plans is to have um, content focused on the tour on on these structural upgrades and um, what that actually means for the museum and what that means for upcoming programming. Um, there will be behind the scenes information shared on our social media channels. Um, so we're really planning on maintain, and we will also be um, hopefully taking many of the collections off site and recreating some of these apartments in other spaces around the city, increasing the accessibility um, for people to attend the museum. So there's lots in store, um, lots of programmatic changes coming up. Um, but after all is said and done, all of the Baldizis objects will be going back in exactly where they are. Um, and that is my big project for this year is to ensure that all of the objects in the building are packed labeled, moved, not broken, stored appropriately, and then put back um, where, they, where they're supposed to be. And Liz also asked what were the conditions in the tenement um, throughout the years. So this apartment, it's, you know, what's interesting is that we conduct tours in it. So when the apartment was brand new, it looked a lot cleaner than this. And since we've been conducting tours, we have a wonderful housekeeping staff, um, but the, the building just degrades over time. So this condition is really uh, similar to the conditions that the Baldizis would have lived in. Um, uh, Josephine came and visited the museum when she was, um, after, the, after the exhibit had been launched. And the one comment she had was that it was a little bit too messy and her mother, Shine em Up Sadie, Rosaria, would have kept a much cleaner apartment. Um, so this is completely typical of the conditions in the tenement. Um, other tenement apartments do not have, in our building, do not have the same built-in storage. Um, they don't, some of them do not have the indoor plumbing because they were um, built before 1905. Some of them um, have very different structures for the kitchen. Um, so the conditions were all relatively the same. Um, it was a wonderful, it was like a very, um, they described it as a salubrious and healthy tenement. Um, and even before uh, the privy, the toilets were opened. There was running water in the rear yard that connected to the aqueducts. There was flushable type toilets. Um, so as far as tenement conditions go, this was typical, but it was also one of the nicer tenements around in the neighborhood. Um, 
So the, there's a question Gloria has about the common bathrooms, including a bathtub or a shower. And I'm going to plug one of our tours. We have a tour called Day in the Life 1933. And on that tour, you actually get to walk to, it's a combination walking tour. Um, so you see the Baldizzi's apartment, but then you also go to the areas around the neighborhood that they would have um, visited. And one of those areas is the um, bathhouse, the public bathhouse. So all of the tenants would have, you know, Rosaria, she's describing her washing up, giving herself a little bird bath in the sink, but all of the tenants would have gone to take baths in bathhouses, um, which aren't common at all in the city anymore, but were completely ubiquitous um, throughout the neighborhood um, before the 1950s, really. And um, Liz also asked a, cash, a question, was gas supplied by the landlord or was it a set fee per apartment? And so gas was actually provided by um, the gas company. So what they did was they um, provided gas to the building and it was metered. And in order to turn on the gas for your apartment, the residents would have had to pay for gas. So the, um, but we even know that the, the gas company came and took back their meters from many of the apartments when it closed. So what's interesting is that some of these meters are from other buildings. Um, like I said, we had the dumpster diving um, in the early collections of the museum's history. So some of these gas meters are from other buildings. Um, a few were preserved from our building. Um, but that was really supplied by the gas company. So all the landlord did was um, improve the infrastructure to allow gas to be um, built into the building. Okay. What else can I talk about? We have four more minutes. And I really hope that you enjoyed this program. Um, oh, there was a question. Did any of the buildings in the area have radiator heating? I'm gonna go back over here. Um, and they did not. All of the heating was provided by um, the gas stove or the, the coal stove. So like I said, um, the apartments never had an issue with being uh, cold in the winter. They were always hot with the coal stove, um, but they were extremely sweltering in the summer. Um, so heating in tenements was never really an issue. It was the cooling that was the issue. Um, another question too, is do the individual apartments have locks on the doors? And that is a yes. Um, in fact, some of the apartments have many locks on the doors. That's another one of the archeology span um, portions that is completely fascinating. Um, the locks on the interior doors, also the locations of mezuzahs um, or Jewish prayer schools on the walls. Um, those are also archeology span that indicate like who lived there, um, you know, their concerns with safety. But one of the things that we know is that the front hall door was rarely locked. So tenants would have kept their individual doors locked on a regular basis. Um, and I hope that everyone likes and subscribes to our YouTube channel. Um, and I will mention that this event typically costs 25 per person. Uh, tonight we're encouraging a suggested donation of $10 and your generosity allows us to continue offering these programs as well as preserving the collections. Um, so Jessica asked, and this will be my final question, do you rotate objects to keep them safe? And the answer is yes. So Josephine's um, mother's uh, table scarf that was up on the wall. We have two of those and we rotate those out on a regular basis so that they don't suffer light, pest, um, and dust damage. Um, other objects we have in storage and we will rotate them out when needed um, for different exhibits. Um, but a lot of the time the apartment is set as it is. So instead of rotating the objects, we will rotate the um, the original objects that were from descendant families, but for a large, lot of the period pieces, um, we will actually replace them when they reach the end of their life, which is not typical for a museum. So um, 
Thank you for joining and learning about all of the different types of objects we have in our collection. And even now how we treat objects a little bit differently depending on their provenance, where they came from um, and the stories they tell. So I hope you all have a wonderful night and thank you again.